2023 was the year of the turtle, the year of the dog, and even the spider. But only one can be seen as animated film of the year. Here's every review roundup of this year's film as critics have their say on what they thought was 2023's best. Starting with a certain cluster of spiders. Let's start with Brian Truitt of USA Today who wrote, This time around, heartfelt moments between Miles and Gwen as well as Miles and his mom show the youngster maturing at the same time he learns truths about the multiverse and faces an existential crisis, as, across the Spider-Verse, builds toward a whopper of a climax. Next is Brian Tallarico of Roger Ebert who wrote, I wish that we weren't seemingly in a blockbuster era of non-endings, but I feel like, Across the Spider-Verse, earns its open conclusion. Moving on to Matt Singer of Screen Crush who stated, The larger canvas also gives directors Joaquin Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin K. Thompson more room to explore the tortured psyches of Miles, Gwen, and Miguel, and to expand into the Spider-Verse's already eye-popping animation in even more audacious directions. Next we got Eric Francisco from Inverse.com who wrote, Even when not at all expectations set by Into the Spider-Verse are met, Across the Spider-Verse nimbly weaves an intricate all-ages blockbuster with rare style and aplomb. As for Owen Gleiberman of Variety, he states, They've done it, Spider-Man, Across the Spider-Verse, doesn't just extend the tale of Miles Morales. The film advances that story into newly jacked up realms of wowness that make it a genuine spiritual companion piece to the first film. In the end, the film amassed an excellent score of 95% from 110 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. The pipe squished me all out of shape. Dang. <laughs> Let's start with Matt Singer of Screen Crush who stated, I'm not sure using different elements as a metaphor for the immigrant experience quite works beyond its broadest strokes, but it does at least add some heft to elemental scenes between father and daughter, which do build to an affecting if extremely predictable conclusion. Next is Bem Kroll of The Rap, he wrote. With story beats and character turns that strain well beyond familiarity, Elemental matches a formal adventure with storytelling timidity. Here is a new spin on the old formula, livened up by advances in technology and delivered with real artistry. Moving on to Isaac Feldberg from Roger Ebert. Perhaps fittingly for a film that would have more accurately been titled, When Fire Met Water. Elemental, is combustible enough from minute to minute, but it evaporates from memory the second you leave the theater. Next is the Hollywood Reporter's Jordan Mincer who wrote, Maybe we've all seen too many Pixar movies by now, and so if Element were the studio's first ever release instead of its umpteenth one, it would seem more surprising, more daring. And now Peter de Bruges of Variety who wrote, There's poetry and soul here, but both are watered down by how much the movie seems to be multitasking. With Pixar, sincerity is elemental. The rest risks distracting from what really matters. In the end, the film amassed a decent score of 79% from 58 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. He's a murderer! He's a monster! He's perfect. We begin with the Hollywood reporter's Frank Sheck who wrote, It's fun to quote the title character because she's eminently quotable and one of the most delightful animated anti-heroes to come along in recent years. Next is Empire Magazine's Ben Travis who wrote, if Nemona occasionally feels a little eager to please early on, it becomes more complex and compelling in the second half as it barrels towards a Princess Mononoke meets Pacific Rim finale, boasting genuine narrative twists and ideas about embracing individuality that run more than skin deep. We move on to Variety's Peter de Bruges who wrote, Easily the most appealing thing about Nemona is the outside-the-box animation style. How often have you flipped through the art of book for some big budget animated feature and wondered why the movie didn't match the brilliant concept art that went into its making? As for The Guardian's Peter Bradshaw, he wrote, Nemona is likable and engaging entertainment that finds its way through self-created chaos to some humane life lessons. While Lindsay Barr of the Associate Press wrote, It is a familiar story even by recent Netflix animation standards. But, Nemona, is wrapped in new, exciting packaging with a wildly fun soundtrack, LGBTQ plus themes that aren't clumsily subtle, and charismatic led voice actors in Chloe Grace Moretz and Riz Ahmed. In the end, the film amassed a near-perfect score of 97% from 29 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. 
I just want to be Ruby Gilman, normal teenager. Let's begin with Variety's Peter de Bruges who wrote, It's a shame that the plot gets so carried away with the supernatural power struggle, since the Milo Minute movie is far more engaging when focused on Ruby and the sitcom-ready aspect of Crark and human relations. Next is Scream Daily's Wendy Eyed who wrote, The story itself is in too much of a hurry to finish, leading to a third act climax that is over before the tension has had a chance to build, and a message of acceptance that might be a little too neat, given all the tentacles and eye lasers that Ruby's school friends have had to suddenly come to terms with. We move on to the Washington Post's Kristen Page Kirby who wrote, While it breaks no new ground and doesn't soar to great heights, it's a perfectly fine way to pass the time. And sometimes that's just what you need. Next is The Guardian's Ellen Jones who wrote, Younger viewers are unlikely to appreciate the story's symbolism but they'll still absorb the ambient Gen Z values of tolerance and authentic self-expression. Kraken Anatomy differs from humans in some aspects, but this is a film with its heart, at least, in the right place. While Arizona Central's Kaylee Monaghan wrote, For all its issues, Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken, is a good excuse to get out of the house with the family and take the kids to see something fun. And that's what this movie is, fun. Even if I was bored and unmoved, the target audience will have a great time. In the end, the film amassed a disappointing score of 68% from 23 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. You are crazy! And handsome! Let's start with RogerEbert.com's Brian Tallarico who wrote, Aggressively mediocre, Netflix's The Monkey King takes no risks and offers too little humor, heart, or action to entertain all but the youngest in the family. Next is IGN's Kenneth Seward who wrote, Netflix's The Monkey King is an example of a potentially great film that's undone by poor pacing, uneven animation, and a truly unlikable protagonist. Moving on to The Guardian's Leslie Felperin who wrote, the latest in a 10,000-mile-long line of adaptations of Journey to the West, bounces along energetically, and has some exceptionally fun frills around the edges, such as a flouncy vocal performance from Bowen Yang as the Dragon King. Next is The Hollywood Reporter's David Rooney, and he stated, Some aspects of the cross-cultural mashup work better than others, but overall, this is a charming attempt to distill a centuries-old story into a quirky folktale that all children can enjoy. As for Alex Harrison of Screen Rant, he stated, Visual creativity and humor are present in flashes, but whatever there is to recommend it is weighed down by a poor script that never finds the story's dramatic center. Once it loses its way, about 15 minutes into the runtime, it never really hooks us again. In the end, the film amassed a rather disappointing score of 61% from 30 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. You're fine, chill. He's gonna die. Let's begin with the rap's Tomris Laughley who wrote, Rogan and his co-writers invitingly nod to the essence of the classic, TMNT, and freshen it up with a teen spirit, an inclusive cast, and a few amusing internet pop culture references. Next is The Messenger's Jordan Hoffman who wrote, While the final battle seemed as what it can to stay energetic, it does lose steam, as is usually the case with movies like this. We move on to Screen Crush's Matt Singer who wrote, The whole package is so trippy and weird. You know, if I didn't know any better, I would swear the guys who made this took a lot of drugs. Next is The Empire's John Nugent and he wrote, A well-worn lunchbox franchise has made one of the more lovable family films you're likely to see this year. And finally, The Hollywood Reporter's Frank Sheck who wrote, Adopting a decidedly younger spin toward its teenage heroes, the hugely entertaining and funny film seems destined to reinvigorate the franchise and attract plenty of nostalgic adults as well as young fans. In the end, the film amassed an outstanding score of 98% from 40 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Paw Patrol! But more! But just a little bit extra! Let's begin with the New York Times' Claire Schaffer who wrote, if you can imagine your kiddo enjoying an animated car chase scene featuring puppies and kittens, set to a Kona Pops, I love it, they'll probably be thrilled with the mighty movie. Next is The Hollywood Reporter's Frank Sheck and he wrote, Unfortunately, much of the film's running time is taken up not with heartwarming stories but rather the sort of typically mind-numbing action sequences stuffing adult live-action superhero franchises. We move on to Variety's Courtney Howard who wrote, 
While not as subversive as its predecessor, it delivers on the promise of a smart and salient sequel with bolder action, bigger stakes, and deeper resonance for all ages. Next is Mercury News Randy Myers who stated, Paw Patrol. The mighty movie is nicely animated and reminds kids to celebrate their qualities and power from within. It won't win awards but it's certain to delight its target audience. We move along with Richard Crose who wrote, Paw Patrol. The mighty movie is bigger and louder than 2021's Paw Patrol or the television show. Returning director Cal Brunker pumps up the action, creating a sort of Marvel movie for the preschool set. In the end, the film amassed a rather impressive score of 85% from 13 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. We're out of sync. We've gone from boys to men and now there's only one direction for us to go. Let's start the with The Guardian's Kath Clark who wrote, The plot makes not one bit of sense and is patently an excuse for a barrage of boy band gags, some a lot less funny than others. But the film is gloriously odd in its own candy floss colored trippy way. Next is the Hollywood reporter Frank Sheck who wrote, Trolls Band Together is stuffed with so many groan-worthy punning jokes and one-liners referencing such bands from the 90s and other eras that you wonder whether the film was made for its target type audience or their parents. Moving on to the Globe and Mail that stated, If the music is less than, the animation in Trolls Band Together is as fun, inventive and gorgeous as ever. Staying true to the boy band spirit, Trolls Band Together looks a lot better than it sounds. Up next is Variety's Peter DeBruge who wrote, as with Illumination's Sing sequel, the series has gone from being a music-driven kiddie confidence booster to a sales pitch for the ultra-processed mainstream music industry. As for Empire's Helen O'Hara, she wrote, It's totally fine and mostly weightless, and there are some fun gags in the zippy script. This is a film that wants to refer to Justin Timberlake's boy band past without giving the other members of NSYNC starring roles. In the end, the film amassed a rather disappointing score of 63% from 35 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Ah, uh, <laughs> and the star answered. First up is Empire's John Nugent who wrote, It feels generic, with a script that doesn't always live up to the standards of Disney's best. The jokes largely land a little flatly, to be appreciated by only the youngest audiences. Next is the Hollywood reporter's Lovia Gyarke who wrote, at the heart of Wish is a topical and winning formula, so it's a shame that it's squandered for the sake of a lukewarm, ultimately safe conclusion. The film co-opts and parades a rebelliousness it doesn't want to commit to, good wins, but only within the existing structure. We move on to the Globe and Mail's Barry Hertz who wrote, The animation also feels half-caught between inspired and derivative, with the vivid backgrounds, woodland cottages and sky-high castles, etched in striking watercolor but the characters and animals rendered with a lifeless kind of computer animation that recalls the soulless eyes of Coco Malin. From there we go to Variety's Owen Gleiberman who wrote, Sorry, but there's no we don't talk about Bruno or let it go here. That may sound like a high bar, but it was Disney, with the quality of those songs, and those films, that raised the bar. The strategy behind, Wish, seems to be, if we do an homage to Enchantment, the audience will be enchanted. True magic, however, can't be recycled. Next is IndieWire's Kate Erbland who wrote, Asha's journey is a classic one, but her biracial background, the immigrant story at its heart, her diverse group of friends, and skipping a love interest subplot hint at something more subversive, something more timely, something more interesting afoot in the House of Mouse. That's what we wish to see more of, and soon. In the end, the film amassed a rather disappointing score of 55% from 60 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Behold, the dawn of the nugget. First up is the Hollywood reporter's Leslie Felperin who wrote, The humor is mostly situational, playing off the disconnect between the chicken's innocent view of the world and the viewer's more experienced insight. The lack of cackle-worthy one-liners here and the entertaining but highly predictable last act make this a little bit snoozy for savvier viewers. After all, what could be more retro in a cartoon than a conveyor belt full of deadly dangers, a trope that goes back to the Max Fleischer cartoons of the 1930s? Up next is IndieWire's Sophie Kaufman who wrote, For all the painstaking visual detailing, Dawn of the Nugget falls foul of some standard-issue sequel anxiety. Whereas the original shocked us early on by using noirish shadows to represent a chicken death, there is a risk-averse approach to showing anything like that this time. 
Next is Variety's Peter de Bruges and he wrote, The sequel doesn't offer many surprises plot-wise, but is consistently amusing in its dad-jokey kind of way. The folks at Aardman can hardly resist a good pun, and they load Nugget with a level of detail that will reward repeat viewings. We move on to Rolling Stone's Jake Francis who wrote, The key issue with Dawn of the Nugget is that it simultaneously feels all too similar to the original and also misses the mark on what made it such a treasured film. A fair amount of the cast is replaced, some for understandable reasons, some for less understandable reasons. Levi replaces Mel Gibson, and while there's certainly a logic to removing the latter from a film like this, Levi fails to deliver on the role and his voice work feels staggeringly flat. The verve and charm that felt so tangible in the performances of 2000's Chicken Run feels otherworldly compared to the relatively mundane performances of Aardman Animation's latest offering. Next is The Guardian's Peter Bradshaw who wrote, Some of the time I found the proceedings a little bit generic, like something you might put on an iPad to keep kids quiet, even if that is a noble enough aim. Also, some of the time, this new Chicken Run has the same flaw as the newer Pixar movies. A sense that the film could almost have been algorithmically fabricated through AI, especially here in the opening act. In the end, the film amassed a pretty good score of 81% from 26 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. That is not your mother. We will start with Hollywood reporters Lovia Gyarkier who wrote, I'm praising Migration so effusively because it is, above all, an enjoyable film made with heart and a respect for its audience. Sure, there are rough patches, a bit about a vengeful chef overstays its welcome, but most of that can be forgiven. A well-assembled cast of voice actors brings the characters to life. Migration's considerable appeal perhaps lies in the simplicity of its premise, the hardest part of embarking on any new journey is taking off. Next is IndieWire's Kate Erbland who wrote, It is very silly and often strange, but it's also sweet and funny, and damn it all if you don't start to really care about this odd little family. It may zing and zag in unexpected formations but it all soars along at a genial enough clip. Up next is The Globe and Mail's Aparita Bandari and she wrote, This is a feel-good movie that offers a little bit of an escape for families with no plans for a vacation to warmer climes. The humor is gentle, and the ensemble cast maintains the tone, although a scene or two may momentarily terrify a truly sensitive toddler. We move on to Variety's Peter de Bruges who wrote, Even at just 70-something minutes, before credits, the movie seems to take forever getting to its destination, delivering its funniest bit up front in the form of Moon, a 10-minute short that catches up with despicable me villain vector, Jason Siegel, in exile and thus, migration finds a way to work in Minions. That's essentially what Illumination audiences want anyway. Not ducks. Next is Seattle Times Soren Anderson who wrote, It's all big action. Big colorful visuals. Outsized vocal performances. And that's pretty much the way it goes in migration. Animated fun for the whole fam. Check that. Fun mostly for kids between 5 and 12, I'd say. Older audience members might quickly find themselves afflicted with the fidgets. In the end, the film amassed a pretty decent score of 72% from 39 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. We should also add that these two films that received an overall rating of 55% and 83% respectively. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem was the highest rated film of the year but do you believe it was also the best? If no, what is your favorite animated film of the year? Please tell us in the comments section alone. And if you thought Disney had a bad year, this video explains why there might be hope for the studio in 2024.